Good evening. evening. Let's bow our heads together as we pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this Pillars of Faith weekend. We thank you for the privilege and opportunity that we have to come apart from the cares of this life, to meditate upon you and your holy word. And this evening, as we spend a few moments studying about your church, your precious people, the body and the bride of Christ. We pray that you would speak to each one of our hearts. We pray that Jesus would be uplifted, that people would recognize that you do have a visible church here on earth. We pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to each one of our hearts, for we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Tonight's topic is the church. And I want to tell you, as a young person, as a young adult, when you mention the word church in today's society, depending on which circles you go to, There's a myriad of different responses that you receive when you mention the word church. Isn't that right? I remember I used to go canvassing door to door. I would sell books and go all throughout the country. And it was amazing how I would go to certain communities and I would share with them these wonderful books. And they would say, David, they would stop me at a certain moment and say, David, I want you to stop right there. Is this religious material? And do you go to church? And I would say, yes. And it was amazing how, do- how fast that door would shut. Just boom. And if you were to go to a person on the street today and ask them the fundamental question, what adjective do you think of when I mention the word church? I think that you would not be surprised to find some of these names. Words like Hypocrites, full of hypocrites, uninformed, naive, boring. If you were to ask them, what emotions do you feel when you mention the word church, they would say things like anger, hurt, apathy, feelings of distrust. It's very unfortunate today that we live in a society in which the word church has a certain tag, a certain stigma that is associated with the word church. We live in a day and age where the word church is almost radioactive. Isn't that right? Sad to say, there's another movement within the church. There's a distrust of organized religion, We stress independence and individuality. It's between me and God. Now, I believe that has an element of truth, but I like to present here today that the Bible presents a relationship not only between Christ and the individual, but also between Christ and the corporate body, i.e., the church. Today, as a reaction to some of these things in society, church has taken the perspective of being a consumer operation. There has been a paradigm shift to where people go to church to see what they can get out of church rather than what you bring to God in worship. Church has become a place where I get benefits instead of a place where I'm going to give glory to God. There's narcissism that has crept into the church, and it has gone from being God-centered to becoming human-centered. This is the society that we live in today, and with all the faults, with all the foibles, with all the idiosyncrasies that our church today has, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 says, Christ also loved the church. Can you say amen? Amen. 
Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. That with all the problems that are in the church today, all the quote-unquote hypocrites, all the idiosyncrasies, and all the things that are wrong with God's church, it is still the apple of God's eye. Can you say amen? God still has a visible church on earth today. This is from the magazine Signs of the Times, July 13, 1904. I love this statement. To God, the dearest object on earth is His church. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, After the glory hath sent me unto the nations which spoiled you, for he that toucheth you, listen to this, for he that toucheth you toucheth the apple of his eye. This is a fundamental belief in Scripture. There is a doctrine of the church, the organized body of Christ, and Paul uses this analogy, this metaphor, to describe the church. Colossians chapter 1, verse 18, And he... Christ is the head of the body, the church. Paul is trying to describe the nature of the church, and he's trying to think of a metaphor that would illustrate the relationship of Christ and the church, and he's thinking in his mind, and he's trying to write down this metaphor, and he says, ah, I got it. The relationship between Christ and the church is just like the human head to the human body. I want you to think about that relationship because so many times in society today, people put the church over here and Christ way over there. They are separate entities. But the Bible presents this picture of the head and the body. Now, if you sever your foot or your toe, life still can exist. But if you sever your head, that's an execution. They are together. They are distinct, but they are inseparable. Paul goes on in Colossians chapter 1, verse 24. What is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church? Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23. Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of of the body. Now, I've heard this in some circles. Why can't I just be baptized into Christ? Why do I have to be baptized into a body, into a church? Where in the Bible is this concept that when you're baptized, you're baptized into membership, into an organized church? I take them to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 5. The Bible is very clear. For by one Spirit, notice the language here in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 5, for by one Spirit we were all baptized, notice the operative word here, we were all baptized into one body. The Bible presents this very clear picture that membership, that when you are baptized, you are baptized into an organized body, the church. And that the way we become a part of God's church, or a part of Christ, I should say, is by being baptized into the church, the body of Christ. Paul goes on, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. Now, I want you to notice the language here. It says, by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. One body. You ever open a phone book before? Someone out there is like, I feel the Holy Spirit speaking to me. I want to go to church. Say so they go to the C's in the yellow pages. Not a lot of people use yellow pages today, by the way. They Google it. And so they get on Google, and they put churches in Thompsonville or East Lansing, wherever you are, and it's just like a smorgasbord. It's like going to the buffet. And you go down through the seas, and there are so many different churches. Many people wonder why there are so many denominations today. This is a fair question. After all, there is just one Bible. I want you to think about this. One Bible, one Savior, one God. Then why is it that there's over 1,000 denominations in the world today? How do we get to this point? It is so confusing that the average person by some point, just puts up their hands and says, forget it, I'm just going to worship the Lord at home. 
have home church. And people ask the question, is it ever possible to find the truth? I like to present this simple principle. You go to the Bible to find out what the truth is. Amen? Then you find a church teaching in harmony with the Bible, not the other way around. And so I'd like to present here this evening how many churches did Jesus establish when he left earth? One. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 through 32 reveals the same thing. Jesus gave himself for the church, singular, definite article. This is an essential point to grasp. How do we get to the point today where we have over a myriad, over 1,000 denominations in the world today? When Ephesians chapter 4, verse 5 says, One Lord, one faith, and one baptism. I'd like to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles here this evening. The first metaphor that the Bible uses is the body of Christ. Christ is the head. We are the body. I'd like to invite you to go to another symbol in the Bible that describes the church of Christ, and that's found in Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12 in verse 1. The Bible describes another symbol of the church, Revelation chapter 12 and verse 1. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. Revelation 12 describes a chaste, beautiful, and virtuous woman. I want you to notice the nature of the symbols that Revelation chapter 12 verse 1 uses. It says that she's standing on the what? She's standing on the moon. She's clothed with the sun, and she has a garland of 12 stars. The only way we get light here on earth, apart from man-made light, is the sun and the moon and the stars. This woman is clothed with light. The Bible describes the church as being a woman. You can see that in Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 2, and 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2. And so here in the meta-narrative of the book of Revelation, you see here in the beginning of this panoramic picture that God depicts the church as being a beautiful woman clothed in light, clothed in truth, and clothed in purity. This is one woman. And yet the fundamental question that people have asked is, or I ask here tonight, is Jesus Christ a polygamist? Here we have the bride of Jesus, the church, one woman clothed in light, and yet people, when they go to look for a church, there are a myriad of churches in the phone book today. I want us to go to a contrasting picture in Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17 and verse 3. Revelation chapter 12 presents a woman clothed with light. In Revelation chapter 17 and verse 3, we have another woman that is the exact opposite of the woman in Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 17 and verse 3. So he carried me into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Now, in Bible prophecy, a beast represents a political power, and this woman is doing what? She's sitting on this beast. Now, if I sit on a horse, well, not me, but someone more trained than I am, an equestrian, all right? If equestrian sits on a horse, the equestrian is dominating, is leading the horse. And so you see here a woman, a church, dominating a political power. There's a union there between church and state. Verse 4, the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls and having in her hand a golden cup full of the abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead, a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and of the abominations of the earth. I want you to notice the contrast. In Revelation chapter 12, we have 
the epitome of purity and light. A woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, on her head a garland of 12 stars. And in Revelation chapter 17, we have a woman who in three times in Revelation chapter 17, the word fornication is mentioned three times to describe this woman. It actually says the filthiness of her fornication. So here you have a woman, purity, Revelation chapter 12. Impurity, Revelation chapter 17. I want you to notice something else about this woman. She is a mother. In other words, she has daughters. One side, pure church, singular. The other side, Revelation chapter 17, a mother with daughters. You have churches, plural. Everyone following here this evening? Purity, singular. Impurity, plural. And I want you to notice that on her forehead is written the name Babylon, which means confusion. That's what you experience when you open the yellow pages today. Confusion. There's a cacophony of noise today in Christendom, and I want you to remind each one of you that the daughters look similar in their respective to their respective mothers, yet they are not identical. In short, end time Babylon has fallen, an unfaithful group of churches which adhere to the teachings and the doctrines and the commandments of men and yet ignore the plain teachings of the Word of God. Thus they create a confusion-laden environment. End time Babylon is the church's fallen. She is not the bride of Christ. I want to dwell a little bit more on this concept of Babylon. This is a Babylonian bride. Even though Babylon was never inhabited again after its fall, even though Saddam Hussein tried to rebuild Babylon, it is never rebuilt to this day, according to the prophecy of Isaiah. Babylon is the center, or was the center, of image worship. This is from Dr. Alexander Hyssop in the book, The Two Babylons. And he says, Babylon was the primal source from which all these systems of idolatry flowed. So when each and every kingdom came into being, Medo-Persia conquered Babylon. They took many of the customs and the idols from the previous kingdom. When Greece came along, they did the same thing. When Rome came along, they were known for polytheism. They thought the more the better. And could it be today that some of the pagan rites all the way from ba ancient Babylon have been infused and injected into Christendom today? Not only was Babylon the center of image worship, but it was also the center of sun worship as well. This is from The Worship of Nature. Dr. James G. Frazier says, In ancient Babylonia, the sun was worshipped from immemorial antiquity. So here we have it. The center of sun worship and the center of image worship. Here's some clues that we can derive about identifying ancient Babylon. Nine clues. Number one, it's a church. Number two, it's an area of many nations. Number three, according to Revelation chapter 17, it's a city. Number four, it rules over kings. It's set on seven mountains or hills. It's clothed with purple and scarlet. It is rich, it persecutes, and it blasphemes. I want to dwell a little bit on the colors here this evening. I want you to notice that it is dressed in the same exact colors as the priest of the Old Testament, purple and scarlet. But there's one color that is missing. It is the color blue. This is an intentional mission because in the Bible, blue represents a significant symbol for something very specific found in the Old Testament. I want to invite you to turn with me to Numbers chapter 15 and verse 37. The Israelites were instructed very specifically to include the color blue in their garments. This is from Numbers chapter 15 and verse 37. Moses spoke to the children of Israel and instructed them in this manner regarding 
a specific color that was to be included in the tassels of their garments. Um, Numbers chapter 16, 15, verse 37. And again, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel. Tell them to make tassels on the corners of their garments throughout their generations and to put a what color? A blue thread in the tassels of their corners. This is a very specific command by God himself to Moses and said when they were to weave their clothing, to make their clothing, they were to include the color blue in a form of a thread in the tassels of their corners. Why? In verse 39, it gives us the answer. And you shall have the tassels that you may look upon it and remember what? And remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them that you may not follow in the harlotry to which your own heart and your own eyes are inclined. So the Israelites, when they're going through their day and they looked at their blue tassels, they were to remember to keep the commandments of God. And here in Revelation chapter 17, the woman is clothed with the exact same colors of the priests of the Old Testament except for the color blue. This is an implication that the woman of Revelation chapter 17 purports to be a priest, God's representative, but is missing the color blue. The author of Revelation is communicating that this is an unfaithful church that has forgotten the commandments of God. Clearly, she cannot be the true bride of Christ because the end time church keeps the commandments of God and has the testimony of Jesus. So just as a review, Revelation chapter 12, the pure church clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, a garland of 12 stars, a symbol of light and purity. Revelation chapter 17, a myriad of churches, a woman, a harlot with her daughters, a symbol of impurity, not keeping the commandments of God. And in Revelation chapter 18 and verse 2, we have the most stark warning, I believe, in all of the scriptures. Yet a message of hope. Revelation chapter 18, verse 2, And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon, the great, is fallen, is fallen. And I heard another voice come from heaven, saying, Come out of her my people. This is a beautiful message because even though Babylon is about to fall, Babylon is fallen, God says that his people are still in Babylon. The reason is lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her plagues. Revelation chapter 18 verses 1 through 5 is God calling his people out of end time Babylon. God claims the people but the systems that teach error and ignore the plain teachings of the Bible are disavowed. I want you to notice that the Bible is very clear that Babylon is not to be reformed, but to be left. God is calling his people out of Babylon. One commentator says the first justification of the woman is in her being called out of Babylon the harlot. When judgment is about to fall for apostate Christendom, Babylon is not to be converted, but to be destroyed. In every apostate or world-loving or world-conforming church, there are some of God's invisible and God's true church who, if they would be safe, must come out. This is what I believe to be the final warning to go out before the world. And yet the fundamental question comes to each one of us here tonight, if God is calling his people out of Babylon, he must be calling them out of something into what? Isn't that right? If God is calling his people out of Babylon and he says my people are out of Babylon, he must be calling them into something, something visible, his visible church in the end of time. And could it be that as we approach the second coming of Jesus, that God is calling us to press together as never before? We're not to be out there doing our own thing, but God is calling an end time movement together. He's calling them out into his visible church. God's end time church will uphold the teachings and the commandments of God over the teachings and traditions of men. It will uphold the divine law 
as a great moral standard. Does God have a church on earth today? The answer must be yes. If the answer is no, then Jesus was wrong when he said the gates of hell will not prevail against her. Jesus wasn't wrong. He wasn't lying. His church is still alive and amidst the confusion and fallenness of the contemporary religious environment, she upholds God's word, God's law, and most importantly, God's gospel. And so very quickly here this evening, I'd like to identify some characteristics of God's visible church here on earth. Number one, it will recapture the pure faith of the disciples. If you're looking for a church today, you're looking for a group of people that hold to the same exact characteristics as the disciples. The Bible calls it the remnant. Now, I don't sew. I'm not a seamstress. But I hear that when you go to a fabric store, there is a remnant bin. Isn't that right, for those of you that sew? Let's say you go to the remnant bin, and in the remnant bin is a black cloth that has polka dots, and inside the polka dot is a red square. Can you see that in your minds? A black cloth, a white polka dot, and a red square. And you're like, I'm going to try to find the larger piece of cloth. And so you're going through the fabric store, you're looking for a black cloth, with a white polka dot with a red square, and you come to another piece of clothing, and it's a, and it's a black polka dot with a, it's a, I don't even know what I'm talking about here today, but it's a black cloth with a white polka dot. It has to match the exact same characteristics. In Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17, the Bible says that they will keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. The end time movement will be a renaissance of the exact same characteristics as the apostles. Number two, segueing into number one, have the dual characteristics of keeping the commandments of God and having the testimony of Jesus as well. Revelation chapter 12, verse 17 says that the testimony of Jesus is one of the characteristics. Revelation chapter 19, verse 10 says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. These two characteristics are linked together you need to find a church that keeps all ten of God's commandments, including the Bible Sabbath, Amen. and has the gift of prophecy as well. We'll expound on that in a minute. It will be, number three, a worldwide mission-driven movement. In other words, it's not just going to be a group of people in Guyana somewhere, locally based, locally driven. This is going to be a worldwide mission-driven movement movement. How do we know that? Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20 gives the gospel commission, go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The Bible presents that the last day church will be a global, mission-driven movement. Number four, it will be Christ-centered. It will call all people to a total commitment to Jesus Christ. Number five, it will lead people to the Bible Sabbath. They will keep all ten of God's commandments, including the Bible Sabbath. I want to remind us of some verses here tonight. Genesis chapter 2, 2, and 3, before there was any Jew on planet Earth, Adam was not a Jew, by the way. At the end of creation, Genesis chapter 2, 2, and 3, and on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he had rested from all his work which God had created and made. I want to notice three simple things here tonight. God blessed the seventh day. He sanctified it, and he rested on the seventh day. Now, if you're in a room and all the churches were symbolically there and you were to say, all the Sabbath-keeping churches, please stand up, I think that it would be a simple equation because there will be only a few churches standing. 
God has made it very simple. In order to find the true church, they need to keep all ten of God's commandments, including the memorial of creation, which is the Bible Sabbath. It was given at creation. It was given and reinstituted at Sinai in the Ten Commandments. It was kept by His people. It was kept by Jesus. It was honored by the disciples. It's a sign of God's power, according to Ezekiel. It would be kept in the new earth. Now, logic would have it, if it's instituted at creation, it's kept all throughout the Bible, Jesus kept the Sabbath, the apostles kept the Sabbath, we'll keep the Sabbath in heaven. Isn't it only logical that we should be keeping the Sabbath right now? God will have a community of faith in the end of time that will be a commandment-keeping people which includes the seventh-day Sabbath. Number six, it will encourage people to give their bodies to Him. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20, For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. God's end-time message will be a holistic message that not only includes the uplifting of the spiritual nature, but also the physical nature as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Number seven, it will make a final appeal to accept the truth. This final message is encompassed in Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 and 7. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, every tribe, every tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. And worship Him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Amen. God's church is not in the majority. God's church is not always the most popular. God's church is not always the most spectacular. And God's church does not need the approval of the popular religious leaders today. Amen. And so when we look for a church, we do not always have to look for the most dazzling or the most brightest or the church with the largest architecture, but we need to go to the Bible to find these biblical characteristics and then find a church that matches those characteristics as well. As we go to truth, as we go to the Bible to find these truths, the truth beckons us to follow it. It burns in our soul. It frees our mind from error. It demands that we take a stand. Now, this evening, I'd like to ask some questions that people have when we talk about an organized body or a church. And as a pastor, I've had to address some of these questions. And one question that I get many times is this one, why do I see so many people problems in the church? I baptize someone every year, a host of individuals, throughout my ministry by God's grace, and it seems like when they go down into the water and they come up the other side, they are rejoicing in the truth they found, they're rejoicing in the community of faith that they found, and they almost come out the other side with rose-colored glasses. Perhaps you've experienced this before. And they imagine, and I believe that the Holy Spirit for a time puts blinders on their eyes, but it's only a matter of a few weeks into post-baptism, or perhaps even before, because they have this mentality that they, when they enter into the church, they are entering into the gates of heaven. And it's only a, a matter of a few Sabbaths that they start looking around, or they start looking at the pastor. Have mercy. <laughs> or they look at the church elder. Or they look at that dear sister sitting in the pew, and they notice that these people are very human. They start noticing faults, problems, and heaven forbid, sometimes they are even hurt. Why is it 
that there are people problems in the church. After all, isn't this God's church? Isn't this the woman of Revelation chapter 12, clothed with the sun, the symbol of epitome of light and purity? In Matthew chapter 13, verse 24 through 30, I'd like to invite you to turn with me there. This is a principle that the Bible presents for God's church on earth today. It's the parable of the wheat and the tares. Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 through 30. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. And while the men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among them, and the wheat among the wheat and went his way. And when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then tares also appeared. So the servant of the owner came and said to him, Sir, do you not sow good seed in your field? How does it now have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. Then the servant said to him, Do you want us to then go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. I want you to notice verse 30. This is very important. Let them grow what? Let them grow together until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles and burden them and gather the wheat in my barns. I want you to notice that in this parable, there are the wheat and the tares, and they are to grow together until the time of harvest. I want us to skip down to verse 36, in which Jesus explains the wheat and the tares. Let's go very quickly to verse 36. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. And he said to them, He who sowed the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is at the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the field, so it will be at the end of the age. I want to read a quotation from a devotional book called Faith I Live By. This is page 302. Has God no living church on earth? I want you to notice the language here. He has a church, but it is the church militant, not the church triumphant. We are sorry that there are defective members. While the Lord brings into his church those who are truly converted, Satan at the same time brings persons who are not converted into its fellowship. While Christ is sowing the good seed, Satan is sowing the tares. There are two opposing influences exerted on the members of the church. One influence is working for the purification of the church and the other for the corrupting of the people of God. Now, sometimes people want to go into the church and identify the tares. That is not our work. Amen? The other temptation that people have is to focus on people. We need to focus our eyes on Jesus. Amen? The author and the finisher of our faith, this is his church. It may be faulty, it may be frail, it may have people problems, but it is God's church, and he loves this church. He will carry it through to the end. Amen? Amen. Last day events, 181. The church may appear as about to fall, but it does not fall fall. I do not believe in this principle of a remnant within the remnant. This is God's remnant, and it is going through to the end. Amen? Amen. We need to stay on the ship. Amen. We need to stay on this boat because Christ is the captain Amen. of this ship. Amen. The other t question, the temptation that people have, why should I even go to church? Ever heard that before? Why not just stay home? <laughs> have home church. Well, this is something that I believe that should be ex an exception. I'm not saying that there are some weekends or some Sabbaths that it's not a sin to stay home 
and worship the Lord, but I say that it should be something that is not a rule. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, we know this, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. The Bible is very clear that we are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. I was just reading the other day an article, and this was a secular person that was amazed as a scientist at the tornadoes that have torn through our country the last few days last few weeks. It seems like you just can't wake up one morning and there's natural disaster after natural disaster after natural disaster. And here's a secular person saying, hold on to your seats because this is the tip of the iceberg. He's saying that the natural disasters in the future are going to be even greater than the ones that we have now experienced. And I can't help but read that and remember Christ's words in Matthew chapter 24. These are the footsteps of an approaching God. And the Bible tells us that we are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but so much the more as you see the day approaching. Could it be possible that we need to press together as God's people as never before as we approach the end of time. We are going to need each other as never before to encourage and build each other up. This is not a time for doing our own thing. This is a time to come together as the community of faith in the end of time because God is calling his people out of Babylon into his remnant church. He'll take care of his church. He'll take care of his body. He'll take care of his bride. The other reason that I believe that coming to church is so important is found in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 20. You remember in the Old Testament that in Exodus chapter 25 verse 8, you see the intention of the scripture, even though that sin had separated man from God, in Exodus chapter 25 verse 8, he says, let them build me a sanctuary that I may what? That I may dwell among them. You see that in the theology of the Bible, God is wanting to come very close. Even so that when he built the tabernacle on earth, there is no floor on the tabernacle. In other words, heaven came all the way down. God wants to be here. He wants to be close. And in the New Testament, you see Emmanuel, God with us. So even though sin has separated us from God, in the message of the Bible, God wants to be as close as possible. We're told in the book Desire of Ages that even though sin separated us from God, that in Emmanuel, in Jesus Christ, that God has come closer than before sin ever came into the world. Heaven is very near. And yet, in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 20, it says, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. We no longer have an Old Testament sanctuary. We no longer have the Ark of the Covenant with the Shekinah of glory. But the Bible presents this incredible principle that when God's people gather together in his name, he says, I am there. Amen? Amen. I am in the midst. And to me, this is the most compelling argument for why we should press together, why we should come together, and why we should come to church. Because Jesus is there. If Jesus said, Saturday morning, Sabbath school, I'm going to be physically there. I believe all of us would clear our calendars. We'd be there early, amen? amen. To meet with Jesus, and yet through His Spirit, He says, I am am there. We go to church to meet with Jesus. The people, the architecture, all of those things are important, but they are secondary. 
Does God have a visible church on earth today? You better believe it. John chapter 10 and verse 16. These are words of hope from the mouth of Jesus himself. And he says, And other sheep have I which are not of this fold. I want you to notice the language of Jesus. I have other sheep out there that are not of this fold, not of this visible church. Them also must I bring, and they also hear my voice, and they shall be, what does your Bible say? And they shall be one fold, and they shall be one shepherd. God is calling people together to his visible church to be part of one fold, part of one shepherd. My question to you this evening, do you hear the shepherd's voice? Is Jesus calling you? I believe that he is. Is Jesus calling me? Could it be that God is calling you to join his end time movement? Will you accept that invitation? I believe it's not by accident that you're hearing this presentation. God has brought Bible truth to you because he believes that you can be trusted with it. Walk in the light while Jesus is presenting the light to you. Will you hear his voice this evening? Will you hear his call? Let's bow our heads together as we pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that you have called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. We thank you for the body and the bride of Christ that even with all the faults, even with all the problems, even with all the idiosyncrasies of human nature, that this is God's truth.